everybody. Welcome here. Presentation about CSS. Today we are going to love CSS3 if you don't already love it. At least that's what I'm going to try to do. Uh, what I'm going to tell you today is um, that you have to use CSS3 today, but I'm also going to tell you where and when you, uh, you can use that. Um, I'm also going to give some examples, but first we're going to do a little uh, history lesson about CSS, how we got here. Um, because it all started in 1993, and that is almost 20 years ago. Um, and it's not particularly uh, the CSS, the cascading style sheets started then, but people started thinking about uh, style sheets in general. Because Robert Raich, uh, he proposed the named style sheets. Well, as you can see, it looks a little bit different, and in my opinion, harder than the CSS today. So I'm Personally, I'm very happy that a year later, in 1994, these two guys came together uh, and started working on CSS, CSS1 back then. It took them um, two years, and this is what it looked in development. As you can see, it, it looks quite a lot like how it looks today, just a little different. So it was in development for two years, uh, and then in 1996, the W3C recommended uh, CSS1 as a standard. As you can see, welcome. Got the three chairs left. <laughs> and then only um, two years later, again, in 1998, CSS2 was recommended by the W3C. Then only one year later, in 1999, CSS3 was mentioned for the first time. In 1999, yeah, that's quite some years ago. It's 2012 now. Um, so that took quite some time, but how, why, why did it take so, uh, so much time? It's because some browsers had more problems uh, to implement CSS 2.1 uh, 2 and 2.1 in their browsers than others. I'm um, not calling any names, but there were some browsers that had a little bit more problems with it than other ones. Um, but it's there uh, today. So we're going to use CSS 3. But where and when can we use it? On what websites and, uh, and where can we use it? We can use it on the critical layers. So we're not going to use it on branding. Um, if you got a logo which you can create by using CSS3, I would not recommend do that because all the other browsers won't see your logo. These, they'll, they'll see nothing. Um, and seeing your logo is quite important, I think. Um, so don't use it on branding, except if you have a good fallback, uh, which shows the logo as an image anyway. Um, don't use it on layout either, because um, there are a lot of nice new features in CSS3 that make it easier for a web developer to, uh, to style a, a layout. Um, but if you're going to do that, if you're going to use that, chances are big that on older browsers, uh, things will really fall apart and uh, start stacking up instead of uh, lining next to each other. So don't use it on layout either, unless, of course, you have a good fallback. Um, and don't, don't use it on usability, because people have, have to be able to use your website. Um, if you got a, uh, an input form and you don't use a border, if you, for example, have a white background with a white input form and you don't use a border, but you use a box shadow, which I'm going to show you later, just a light gray box shadow to make it glow a little bit, um, on an older browser, you, you'll see nothing, because it's just a white background and then a white input field and no border, just a box shadow. That's not working. So that's not very handy either. Then, always progressively enhance. So make sure the website works in the older browsers. Um, in my opinion, it doesn't necessarily have to look the same. It doesn't have to look super fancy. But make sure that the content you are providing, make sure that that works on the other browsers. So, um, so no fancy text effects um, if it's needed to, to, show, uh, to actually show the text. 
just make sure that every, all the content is readable on the older browsers as well. And watch out for some performance problems with CSS3. Because if you use a lot of uh, box shadows and text shadows, or you use them on very large uh, elements, the website will get really, really slow. There are some great examples nowadays on the internet that, uh, that use a lot of HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS3 in all the box shadows and gradients. And if you visit those websites, you, you can really see that most of the time they're really, uh, really slow if you are on a little bit older computer. So watch out for your performance, because your website has to be fast, otherwise the users will be gone. So then, some examples. Um, I'm going to start with, the, uh, with RGBA, because I will use that a lot in the, uh, in the other examples as well. So then you know how that works. Um, and I won't get really into depth today, because there's no time for it, and it can get a little bit hard. Um, so we'll just, I'll just uh, uh, stay um, on the horizon a little bit. So this is um, RGBA. Um, I've got two examples. I've got an example, uh, example on the older browsers, uh, on Internet Explorer 8 and lower. Uh, and the bottom ones are the examples of the real CSS3. So what I did is uh, I made a paragraph and I just made black text. Uh, you always have to start with a, a non-RGBI color first, so the older browsers will actually uh, see the color as well. What I did here is um, RGBA, it's a red, green, and blue, and the A stands for alpha channel. So I've put in zero red, zero green, and zero blue, and then I put A1, which stands for 100% alpha channel, so that's, as you can see, the same. It's just black, but then in another way. In the second example, I did it with red and I used the alpha channel. So the, the values from the red, the green, and the blue go from 0 to 255. Um, so I put full red in, and no green and no blue, and an alpha channel 50%. So you see that the text is 50% red on a white background. It would look a little bit different on a black background. So it's uh, 50%. Um, the bottom example is an example with, uh, with just more uh, a, diff a different example with different values for the red, green, and blue. And then 0.25%, uh, so that's really, really light. Um, you can use RGBA on uh, colors, on backgrounds, and on borders. So I've got some examples of, a, of using RGBA on a background here. So on the top example, um, which you can't really see because it's a little bit too light, um, I first put in a bla black background for the older browsers, as you can see there. And then I put an 80% uh, black uh, background for the other box. However, you can't really see it because for me it looks just black here, but it's actually 80%. So we'll just go to the next example. Um, so that's a full red, a full green, and a full blue, which three of them create a white, and then 25% alpha. Well, as you can see here, uh, there's a lot of difference, and I put a, an, an image behind it to uh, make the effect, to show it, show the effect better. Um, and then on the, uh, the bottom one, uh, once again with another color to show. So this works uh, for backgrounds, um, and as I said, it works for borders as well. So again, um, I put a 30% black border, which will make it gray. But as you can see in the second example, I put a 50% uh, white border in, which makes it light purple. However, the second example looks exactly the same, which should be white uh, if I would, it, would, would have done it the way that I did before. However, that's not the case. In this case, I I made this element first, I went to the website, took a screenshot, and then in Photoshop I took a color picker to check the color it created. Um, 
and then the, what's that color? So I put that in for the older browser so it will look exactly the same. If you change the 0.5 to 0.4, it will look different, of course, but it's still better than a white background around that one. Um, and in the bottom example, I yeah, it's, it's an example of uh, an alpha border on an image uh, element, but it doesn't work that well yet. Um, and it's not really, you can't re really see it that well, but the only uh, place that the border is really working is on the bottom, because in the top it's just, it's just taking another piece of the image and putting that on top. So I wouldn't recommend using um, the uh, alpha borders on imaged backgrounds yet. Um, another thing you have to know about the borders is that it always takes the color of the element itself. As you can see here, the element itself is purple. So the uh, alpha border takes 25% of that purple, of the, uh, of the white, so it gets a light purple. Which is actually a little bit weird, because the box model says that the border is outside of the element, always. But in this case, um, the border is outside, but it uses the background color of the, uh, of the element itself. So that's something you should, uh, should look after. If you want another, uh, another background color, you should actually put another container around it with another color, so you can do that. Then, another fun thing to do is um, a text shadow. And text shadow was introduced in CSS 2.0. However, it was taken away again in CSS 2.1, which we all used, it, used until a couple of years ago, which is a shame. But now it's back, uh, so we can, uh, we can use it again. Um, it's a little bit of a shame, but it doesn't work in Index Explorer 9. Uh, and it's a fun thing to use, and it's a handy thing to use, and it's, it's really a shame that it doesn't work in Internet Explorer 9. But it works in 10, so we just have to wait a little longer and all update our sof software, system software. Um, but what I did here is not just a regular shadow, because you know, well, that's a little bit easy. So I tried to um, to make it look like the the words are stamped into the background. Um, as you can see here, there's a lot of things going on. Um, I'll just I'll just go through them. The one pixel says that we have to go one pixel to the uh, to the right then. If you say minus one pixel, then you go one pixel to the left. Uh, the second is for um, uh, top and bottom. So minus one is top and uh, one is go to the bottom. Then there's the zero, which is for the blur. So there's no blur on the, on the first um, value there. And you can put a color in there. Now you can put hex colors in, you can put uh, RGBA, SLRA, you can put all the, uh, the CSS colors existing, you can put in there. And I've got v four values here, um, which are separated with a comma. So you can put as much uh, text shadow values in as you like, as long as you separate them with a comma. Um, and the thing is that the, the one on top, so the first one, because you can also put them in a line with commas, uh, is the one that shows on top. So if I put that one on top, the rest would disappear because the two pixel border or text shadow is bigger than the one pixel one. So if you are, uh, if you're playing around with text shadows and something's not working, if you got multiple shadows and the last one should be <coughs> red, but all the text shadow you see is red, <coughs> then you probably put them in the, in the wrong order and you should turn them around. Another example is uh, 3D text. Um, I just started with saying that it's got some performance problems if you use a lot of text shadows in elements. So I would not really recommend using this on your body text because it will just be too much. But you could use it in, uh, on titles and uh, subtitles somewhere on, on the website um, if it's complementary to the website itself because it has to look good, of course. So as you can see, I put a lot more uh, shadows around here. Um, I go nothing to the left and the right. It all stays uh, right behind the, the text itself. But I go down one pixel, two, three, four, five, and then ten pixels. So you get the, the effect that it's, it's becoming a 3D text. And then I end it with two 
um, two black blur shadows to make it look like it's actually on the paper itself. That's where, where the black shadow is coming from. And as you can see, that's the bottom one, then that one, and it goes up, uh, just like I said before, with the order uh, to get this. If you turn that around, you get, if you put that one on top, you only get the text with a big black shadow around it. So that won't work. Um, and then there's, of course, always this example because you can make fire with uh, text shadows. It's on the, on the CSS3.info website. I just took it there to show. I think we should all be using this in our headers because it looks so awesome. Super cool. Hmm? Could be possible, yeah. Could be possible. Yes, <laughs> that'd be really cool. <laughs> um, apart from text shadows, we also have box shadows, which is nice, because uh, then you can use it on all the other elements as well, not only on text. Um, what you can see here are vendor prefixes. And vendor prefixes are there to use. You shouldn't only use the box shadow, but you should use the other ones as well, as long as it's not uh, in the standard by the W3C. And I've got a sheet at the end of the presentation which gives you a website where you can check out whether you have to use the vendor prefixes and which ones. But they are there so that the browsers can, can test. They can play around with the new features without um, having uh, hundreds and thousands, thousands of websites using the box shadow itself, which will uh, eventually not be in the standard. So it's a safe way to, to use all the values. And uh, if it gets in the standard and it stays the same, then you can just leave it the same. If, it's st um, if it gets in the standard, but it becomes something different, then it doesn't matter because the vendor prefix, prefix is there. Uh, but more information is also on the, uh, uh, on the sheet with the website on it later. Uh, in this case, we only have to do the WebKit and the Mozilla vendor prefixes, because uh, Opera and Microsoft both uh, just directly implemented it. So they don't have any vendor prefixes. Um, so you can just use them safely, and it just won't work in the older versions of Opera and Microsoft browsers. Um, the order here is very important as well. You always have to start with the vendor prefixes and end with the actual box shadow to make sure that that's the line that the browser will pick up. If you turn that around um, and you put the, the, the real box shadow first and you end with the WebKit box shadow, then uh, on every WebKit browser it will take the older um, and not valid option, the, the not valid value. So that's the, uh, the correct order. Um, this is a very simple uh, box shadow, um, just five pixels to the bottom, five pixels to the right, no blur at all, and then 30% black. But you can also do different things with a shadow, because it's called a box shadow, but you can also make boxes glow by using a shadow. Um, and what I did here is actually very simple. Um, I created a, uh, a box shadow that's right behind the element because it, it doesn't go to the left and the right or the top and the bottom, so it sits directly behind it. But if you give it a one pixel blur, it will go that one pixel outside of the box, so that gives you a small uh, little black line there. And then a 15 pixels white uh, uh, box shadow also right behind the box, so that makes the, the box look like it's glowing a little bit. So you can play around with it and not only use a shadow is a shadow, but you can use a shadow for a lot of <laughs> other things as well. And then there's something that looks rather daunting over there. Uh, there's a lot of things going on, uh, but the main thing uh, I want to tell you about this, there's two things. I, I'm using an inset um, text shadow, so you can use inset shadows as well, not only outside of the box, but you can use a shadow inside of a box. Uh, and in that case, um, it's five pixels from the uh, from the top and from the from the left from the inside. And if you use the minus, it, it will start 
right there. So it's just the other way around. Um, and you have to put inset there. And then another thing which is, is really cool is that there's another value right there. Um, I'm going nothing to the, uh, to the left and the right, and I go 10 to the bottom. I have a 10 pixel blur. Um, and then there's this value, and that's the spread. And I'm actually saying that the spread should be 10 pixels smaller than it, than it is. And what you'll get is that, as you can see on the bottom, it doesn't stick out on either side, but it stays inside of the box. Um, one thing to watch out, that value has to be right. If you make it too large or too big, it will never show up because it's right behind the element. So it's got to be, if it's, ten, if it's all 10, it's all right because then it's there. But you have to, have to watch out that you don't make it too big or too small. So that's about uh, the box shadows. Them, which is really nice, <coughs> the are the corners. I think everybody is really happy with this because yeah. it saves a lot of images and a lot of uh, diff elements. I really like it because, as I said, it saves images, but it also gives you more options in a way that, oh, wrong button. If, if you had to do this in an image, um, then you had to define at least one of the two colors. So you had to have or a white rounded image or a green rounded inset image. Um, what you can do now is, um, you can, you can still later on very easily change the color of both the background and the element itself without having to save all the images as well. So that's really nice. Um, as you can see, uh, the WebKit and the Mo Mozilla uh, vendor prefixes again. And this is just a very simple shorthand uh, border radius of 20 pixels. So it, on every corner, it rounds it with 20 pixels. You can also do other things with it. You can make circles. If you want to do that, uh, an easy way to do it is just put a very large uh, value there. So it's always larger than the width and the height of the element. So it's an easy way to cheat a circle. Um, but don't, don't use it as an actual, uh, for example, sales, sale element on your website if it's really important because on the older browsers it's just a square box. So have to know that. Um, and then it's also possible to use different amounts for every corner, or in this case, um, shorthand for 20 pixels in the top left and 20 pixels in the bottom right, and 60 for the other two sides. Um, so you can also put four values there, and they get all different. Uh, every corner will get a different border radius. And if you really want to go further, it's also possible to define that piece of the border and that piece of the border. So you can actually, uh, yeah. I, I'm not going to show you that because it's just too much. But if you really want to do it, it is possible. It could be interesting to, to use percentage to make an ellipsis. Sorry? Uh, if you use percentage, you can make an ellipsis instead of a circle. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but you can also just change the uh, height of the element and it will get an ellipsis too, I guess. Change the height of the circle. Well, I'm not sure about that. I never tested it. But yeah, you can make ellipses as well. If you make a border radius 50%, you can yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Then, something that looks really daunting again, but it's not. Because you don't have to do this. There's CSS3 gradient creators all over the web. And in the slide that will come up at the end, there's one that I use uh, a lot of the time. So, gradients. Uh, also really nice, so you don't have to use images anymore. Uh, plus, it um, adapts to the element, so if the element gets higher, the gradient will get higher as well, which is really nice, so you don't have to do all the images again. But the only problem is that the W3C doesn't really know what the standard should be yet, because it's I think it's about half a year ago that they changed it again. Um, so in this case, it's really important to use all the vendor prefixes. So you make really sure that if the standard's there, 
uh, that all the websites have valid CSS. But as I said, you don't have to do this because you can just go to a CSS3 gradient curator and it gives you everything in a nice uh, copy-paste uh, screen. So you can just use that. Um, so you got all, uh, linear um, gradients, but you could also have radial gradients, which also will be produced by the software online. Um, but as you can see, I changed a little bit here because I made it a whole background now. Here it's a background image because um, it is a background image, which is weird to me because I think it should be a, a background gradient as a value, but it's actually a background image. Um, how you use it today. If I do not put the um, image there, I can create um, gradients that use RGBA as well. So as you can see, I put the image behind it, it goes to, what is it, 50% blue. So it, it fades out. If I would have put the image behind here, it would only change the image of the background. And as you can see, we defined a background color first for the older browsers. So the background color is some color. I think blue. I'm not that good in reading hex. Um, but if I changed it to image, uh, you will actually see the, the color background behind it, as I can show you in this image. So it's got a red background uh, color, and then it's got a gradient image on top of that. So that makes sure that the, the, uh, the image is separate from the background. So the background will always be red, and you don't see the image behind it anymore. But you can use this as well as an advantage. Because if you got a website and you got a gradient that goes to a particular color, you can give the element uh, that background color and then put a background gradient uh, on top of it and just go from one color to another color, and, but then to 0% uh, uh, alpha. So if you change the color of the entire element of the entire website, the background, then you don't have to do the copy-pasting of the uh, gradient again, so you can use it to your advantage. So much for, uh, for gradients. Um, multiple background images in one element. Again, saves us a lot of uh, div containers. You can only use one and put all your backgrounds in there. Uh, there's no vendor prefixes or anything needed. Uh, if the browser supports it, it supports it. And if it doesn't support it, it will ignore the whole uh, background rule. So again, make sure that you have uh, a background for the older browsers. One thing you can do is if you created this, go to your website, um, make a screenshot and make a pattern out of it and put that one uh, as a regular background. So even the older browsers have all the uh, all the backgrounds and gradients features as well. Something you can do. Um, and in this case, I put the background color separately. And I have to do that because if I put the background color in with the entire line, it won't work. Because you can use uh, a background color, an image, and a gradient at the same string. Uh, the, the browser will just ignore it. But uh, shamefully, but that's how it works. Um, and if you set the background color, that's something that comes as an advantage then. If you set the background color separate, then you can change this color to red and everything will be uh, red, but then with the wood on top of that. Here's some two funny things that are actually around for quite some time, but not uh, very much people use these. Uh, it's a word wrap and a text overflow. And what it does is you can uh, actually, uh, you can, yeah, word wrap, you can wrap your, break your words, uh, which comes in very handy at, um, if you got a website and you got a blog overview with all the, uh, um, with all the blogs and uh, it's, it's one link. And you don't want it to get out of the element. You can just put a word wrap break word and it will break it put it on the next line, and it looks good again. Uh, the bad thing about this is 
is that it doesn't recognize words in any language. So we'll just cut at the amount of width that's available. So it will not, um, as you can see, well, that's not a, a real word, but it will it won't recognize words. So it, it will just cut it off when the the width is done and put the rest of the one word on the uh, on the next sentence. So that's something that they could work on, in my opinion. Another thing is a text overflow. And if I put ellipses there, you can see that it actually uh, puts an ellipsis there. And this is all the browser work. There's uh, nothing uh, that you have to do in your CSS. You don't have to put images there, or you don't have to put a content value there. If you put the ellipsis there, it will just uh, give you the ellipsis. Um, and you can also use clip, and it will just clip it off. Um, and it will be gone. Same if you got the website with the blog overview with the, with the links there or just titles there, you can just uh, cut them off. Um, so it will look all the same and very decent. If you use a hover on that element and you make the overflow visible, then the text will just overflow the element and the whole string will be visible again without breaking your uh, content. So it's, it's handy to do that. It doesn't work on your iPhone or iPad, of course, because you don't have, an, uh, have a hover there. Um, yeah. But it's nice for, for desktop. Question? Uh, how, how do you uh, catch a background text so it can be, uh, you can read it uh, on the screen? Uh, I'm, sure I'm not sure if you can just uh, give the diff or the paragraph a background. Work. doesn't work? OK, well, then you have. Yeah, then you have to put an extra sp span in there uh, and make that one uh, not an overflow. Don't give it an overflow, but if you, I can, I can uh, explain it to you later after this. Then, uh, some nice things, transitions uh, and animations and uh, transforms. Uh, just real quick, because it, it can get quite tricky. Um, all the vendor prefixes are needed. And what you can do is you, you've got certain values that you can tr transition from the one state to the other state on a hover, for example. So I'm, I'm telling that if I uh, hover, then the background and the color should take half a second to go from point A to point B. The thing is that you have to put the transition in the uh, regular element and not in the hover state element. As you can see, the hover is just, just there. So you have to put it in, in, the, in the normal one, and then when you hover, it will use the transition and, um, and you will see the transition. I've got a movie here. That thing is a movie. I'm hoping it will work, but you never know that. I think it does. So it basically just changes the background and the, uh, the color. Not very fancy, but just a quick example. Then there's also transforms, uh, which are nice to use, but not really yet, because um, it's more a thing that you would use in layout, and well, the other browsers don't really see that yet. Um, but there's a couple of things you can do. Um, you can skew. Uh, an image, for example, or just a, uh, a container. Uh, you can scale it, so you can make it uh, smaller and bigger, rotate it, and translate. And translate is uh, moving it from left to right and top to bottom. So it's just the, uh, the x and the uh, dy uh, values. So you could, if you've got a photo overview and you've got nine photos, it could be nice that if you hover them, they get bigger and turn a little bit. Um, but as I said, it's not that implemented yet, so I wouldn't recommend using it on important things. But if you got a, a photo overview, it could be nice to just use it uh, to make it look a little bit better if your browser does support CSS3. And then there are animations. Uh, and animations are actually, I, I'd like to think of them as uh, transitions with more frames. Because a transition is from 1 to B, and an animation can go from A to Z, or A to whatever, from 1 to 999. 
you can make as, money, uh, as many steps as you like in an animation. But it's basically, yeah, it's a little bit the same. Um, making an animation consists out of two things. The first thing is that you, um, uh, you create the animation itself. And this doesn't do anything. But you got your keyframes. Uh, you give it a name, you can, the, the name is animate, you can give that any name you like. I could also name that Robin, and then it will be my name there, and I could later on uh, ask to play the Robin animation, as I will show you in the next sheet. You gotta define a zero and a 100%. If you only do the zero and a 100%, you got a, a transition. Um, but I also added in a 25%, so it will, at 25% of the time, it will look like this, and then it takes another 75% of the time to go back to that. Um, how do you define that? You do it like this. So this time you do put it in the hover. You don't put it in the normal state, but you put it in the hover state. And what you say is, I want to play animate, so that could also be Robin. Um, I want it to take three seconds uh, and I want it to loop infinitely. You can also put one or two or five there. Uh, I put this one on, uh, on infinite. Um, and I've got another video, which I'm very confident will work now. So as you can see, it takes 25% to get big really fast and then 75% to, uh, to go smaller again. So. Don't use it too much, because it will be uh, Christmas on your, uh, your website. <laughs> no good. Um, another really nice thing are CSS3 selectors. And I'm only going to show you a couple. There are actually uh, very much CSS3 selectors now. On the sheet that's coming, it will also give you a website with an overview of these selectors. Um, but this is a regular table. Uh, if a couple of years ago we wanted to have uh, the zebra style, so the first and the third and the fifth row will get another color, you'd have to do that with JavaScript, uh, detect the rows, give it a class, and then give the class, um, the row, another color. You can do that with NTH child now. And all the odd rows will get a light gray background. So that's the only thing you need. No JavaScript, nothing, just this. So you can uh, you get your zebra table there. Another nice thing is that you can just put um, a value there. So I want the fifth row to be a light yellow, and you can put a lot of things in there. There's actually you can actually make a lot of calculations with the MTH child if you put enough things in there. So you could basically say that the third and the thirteenth and the twenty-third row will get different colors and stuff like that. There's, there's a lot of things possible, but it's a little mathematical. Uh, takes you some, some time to, uh, to get into it and learn it. Then there's also a new um, fun thing that's a first of type, which is actually kind of the same as a, a first child. Um, as you can see, there's a last child and there's also a, a last of type. Um, the only thing is that you can't do any calculations with a first and a last child, and you can do calculations with a first of type and a last of type. So you can play around with it a little bit more if you like to. Then, another uh, example where I put a lot of things that I told you together a little video. So there's multiple backgrounds. And the thing is glowing, as you can see, a little bit. And then you got the press button. Well, it's all CSS. Uh, you won't see this on the website very quickly, I think, but just an example of what you can do with it. Uh, there's a lot of things possible without using uh, uh, JavaScript now. Um, so there, here, come, here comes the sheet with all the websites on it. Um, the presentation will be available online, so, well, you can take a picture and you can write it if you want it really quick, but I think they will be online uh, somewhere Monday or something. And there's only five, so it's not that much. Um, CSS3.info is a website that has a lot of information about CSS3. Um, some examples uh, is what you can find there. I was talking about the vendor prefixes and a website that 
will show you whether you should use them or not. That's the html5police.com website. Uh, that it's basically a website with a search box on it. And if you type uh, gradient in there, it will give you uh, one result. You can click it and you can see directly see whether you should use a vendor prefix. If you should use it or better, don't touch it yet because there's uh, some things that you shouldn't be using in CSS3 right now. Um, a very handy website if you're not sure whether you should use that option or not. There's CSS3, please, and that's um, it's a website with a lot of CSS3 options which you can directly edit there. So you don't have to uh, put something up localhost if you want to test something real quick. It's like a JS fiddle, but then uh, it's got all the CSS3 options right there. You can edit them right away. Uh, there's the gradient creator I use. The only uh, main, the main reason why I use it is because I've, I'm using the Colorzilla um, uh, extension. And if I click that in my browser, it takes me directly to the gradient creator. So I don't have to uh, type in anything. So I'm really lazy. Um, and there's the uh, W3 site with all these CSS3 selectors. Uh, really, I would really recommend that you check that out and see what's, what's going to be possible in the next couple of years when Internet Explorer is ready for C CSS3 selectors. Well, it's basically waiting for them, right? So I covered a lot today, maybe a little bit fast, but I'm right on time. Um, anyone has the first question? Yeah? What did you recommend to, to uh, feature our site sheets works with old browsers and not with the most recent browsers. How you make sure that they work in all the browsers? That's what you're asking. Mm, no. Why did you recommend that we uh, work with? Um, we were sure that our style sheets works with the old and not with the newest browser. Uh, well, um, why I recommend that is because the um, all the websites has to be have to be able to view your information. So what I said, I don't think it's really necessary to make them look the same. So you don't have to put the rounded corners there if, they, if they're not supported. Then you get all square corners. There's no problem as long as the information is there. So I'm not bothering about old browsers style-wise that much. If it looks completely different, I don't care as long as I can read it and it's got the, the basic idea. And, and it works, yeah. So for me, it's actually it's uh, Index Explorer eight and up, and then uh, seven. It, it's got a market share of I think fifteen percent, so and it's decreasing every month. So I check it there, make sure it it looks all right. And like the ES seven, IE seven only has one or two percent on the websites we build, and uh, Index Explorer eight has fifteen percent. So um, I wouldn't. I, I'm not bothering too much. I'm just making sure that the content is readable on the other websites, because that's the most important thing. Yeah. Any other questions? No? All right. Um, if I want to leave you with some things today before you leave, um, it's those four things. Uh, just start using it today, because it's there, and it can make your website looks, look better. So uh, just use it today, but be careful where to use it, because as I said, don't use it on branding and layout and usability. Um, make sure it works on all the browsers. Uh, progressively enhance, a little bit the same. Um, work your way up from a mobile device to a new desktop computer so you make sure that the content is available on the older browsers. Style doesn't matter as long as the content is there. Always put your users first. So if you're creating something, um, think about what your users will think of it. Don't put it there because you think it's awesome and it looks cool and flashy, but make sure that your users can actually use it. Uh, and don't let it take over, because when JavaScript was first invented, you got all the strings running behind your mouse. And don't use animations all over the place and transitions. Just use the tool to make things look better and not worse. Time's up. Thank you very much. Thank you.